We are all here for the same reason, to make money online. We are all aspiring entrepreneurs who are just in different stages of our business journey. Some of us did not yet make the first buck and some of us are already running as solo entrepreneurs and even as CEOs of the organizations that we've built from scratch. As a member of the online entrepreneurs community, I decided to go on a journey and meet up with people who have already done it and have become online entrepreneurs. Today on the show, I have with me Dobri, and the most interesting thing about him is that he created a successful software for dropshippers without having any experience in dropshipping. He has never done dropshipping, and yet he managed to become an entrepreneur and run a company of 10 people. What are the skills that were required from him in order to be able to do that? What led him to go into that journey? And what could you learn from this? I hope that you will find his story inspiring. And I just want to remind you that if you're watching this on YouTube, then please consider to subscribe to the channel, click the like button under this video to help us promote it, and comment if you have any questions to Dobri or to me. Uh, if you are, if you prefer to listen to this show, it's also available as a podcast in any of the podcast apps like Spotify. And because it's new, we would appreciate if you could leave us an honest review uh, of what you think about the show. So without further ado, let's jump to the interview. Dobri is waiting. I'm waiting. Let's go. Dobri, thank you for uh, joining me on the show. I want to ask you the question that is that I like to start this show with, um, which is eventually probably the most interesting question for people uh, that people want to know, uh, which is how do you currently make money? What are the income channels that mm-hmm. feed Dobri, uh, Dobrev, and and you know how do you make money currently online? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, awesome question. And thank you for having me on the show. So uh, for the last few years, I've been working with a friend of mine on building a number of uh, uh, SaaS solutions for mostly for dropshippers. And those are my main sources of income. So basically, we build products that are useful to online sellers, mostly dropshippers on eBay and Amazon. And they pay us monthly for for the ability to use those solutions. Uh, right. I think the name are attractive. Right. Software, software. Right? So you can SaaS for the people that doesn't know what it mm-hmm. means. It's software as a service, which means an online software that you pay subscription to, usually monthly or anything. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and the beauty of SaaS really is that as long as you build something that people find useful, they stay on and they build a recurring revenue for you. So mm-hmm. you try to acquire the customer once and then they stay, I mean, it really depends on the software, but they tend to stay a long time as long as what you're doing is actually useful to them. So mm-hmm. you can concentrate on making the product good so that they can stay longer and that way you know that you bring value to them and they pay you and then everybody's happy. Right, and you guys already have an uh, employees? Is it a big team? Yeah. What's the size of the company? Uh, size of the company is 10 people right now. 10 people, Ten people. We're, yeah, we're all Bulgarian. Uh, a few of us are here in Sofia, and then some people work remotely from other locations around the country. Beautiful. Nice. So basically what you're saying, the structure of your monthly income is that you've created a software company, mm-hmm. and that company got customers who pays it a monthly subscription, kind of a retainer. Yeah. And then you are being hired by that company, and once a year you get dividends, right? That's about the. Yeah, the that's basically how it works. Mm-hmm. Right, this is the same way that we work in DSM Tool. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm basically, I work a nine to five job, but in my own company because I'm hired mm-hmm. by my own company. Exactly. So I guess for you it's the same. Uh, exactly. But what's interesting for me is you're saying dropshipping, like software, software mm-hmm. for dropshipping or technologies for people that do dropshipping. What about e commerce? It's a great do you question. Do any e-commerce today? I myself don't do any e-commerce right now. My partner does have a separate company where they do actual e-commerce on, on eBay. 
Um, and that's, that's been actually super useful to us to have as a, as a basically a group of people that we can try things with, we can learn from, we can test with. So in the end of the day, those are our, our ideal customers and we have them sitting right next to me virtually. So um, that has been super useful to have around. What a beautiful story. So you're saying I have become an entrepreneur creating software for dropshippers without being a dropshipper myself mm -hmm. because my business partner has another company who does dropshipping and they are our customers. They help us build that product. Mm -hmm. How is that flow working? What is your responsibility and what is your business partner? responsibility great question uh, and and to be honest that the answer to that evolved over over time so the way we started was I brought the technical abilities and he brought the understanding of the market so being a dropshipper he knows what dropshippers need he knows where dropshippers hang out etc etc so he brought that knowledge I brought the knowledge of like how do you actually build this thing how do you make sure that it works properly how do you build clients and so on and so forth so all the software related stuff and that's how we started. So actually in the beginning, it was just the two of us. I was coding, he was designing and promoting and all that stuff. With time, those things started to change quite a lot. So, you know, we started hiring a team. He built the pipeline for support, like actually, you know, having support shifts, live chat, how do we handle cases, all that stuff. He got pretty good at design. So he does all the user experience design and all that stuff. While I started dabbling more into the marketing things, working with our uh, YouTube content creators, uh, hiring a software team, learning how to podcasts. work together. Sorry? Going on podcasts as a guest. Going on podcasts and all sorts of things. So in the beginning, it was very cut and dry. I was doing the software stuff. He was doing everything else. Nowadays, it's a bit all over the place. Nice. So if someone listens to this, um, to this show and they want to become an online entrepreneur mm -hmm. uh, and they don't do yet, they don't yet do drop shipping. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I say like your first step could, or maybe even should be uh, starting your own drop shipping business because you want to become professional at something. And mm -hmm. then from there you can grow into doing other things like I've interviewed people who started by doing dropshipping and then most of the people started by doing dropshipping and then uh, developed their own software for to, to mm -hmm. serve other dropshippers. But your story is different and I want to ask you if someone has like what kind of set of skills do you need if you want to join a venture like the venture that you uh, mm -hmm. joined? to join a business as a founder, as a co-founder, what kind of abilities uh, do you need or skills do you need mm -hmm. um, if you don't know the market itself that you're going to serve? Uh, that's a great question. So I, the way I look at a software company is you need three things. One is uh, an idea, which means understanding the market and finding something that people want that you need to address. That's the part where you it would be useful for you to be I don't know, a very experienced dropshipper because you or, really or whatever, right? You might be a very experienced photographer and do photography apps. Like doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, there, then there's the ability to actually build the solution. So that's where software skills come in. And the yeah. third one is the ability to market and sell that solution. So that's where, you know, it really depends on what you're doing, but it's either uh, B2B sales or marketing or B2C or whatever, some way of actually getting people to know about what you're doing and getting them to try it and then hopefully buy it. So those are really the three skill sets. And I think the, the most useful first step is to realize what of those three things you're good at and then look for people who are good at the other, the other three, uh, the other part of the three, uh, skill sets. So try to find somebody with whom you can complement each other and get all those three bases covered. So in our case, for example, uh, I bring the software chops, Valentin brings the understanding of the market, and then together we do the marketing. Yeah. There, I know a lot of other cases where that distribution might be different in some way, but somehow these bases need to be covered. I think that each one of these bases is a a very, very complex world to learn. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that a lot of times I talk about the journey of starting from eBay dropshipping and then developing and taking your profits and then investing them into Shopify dropshipping mm -hmm. because lear learning uh, uh, development skills, that, that's not for everyone a lot of times, but mm -hmm. like a, a lot more people are more easy with learning the marketing side of things. Mm -hmm. And then if you start with eBay dropshipping and then you reinvest your profits into Shopify dropshipping, then you kind of finance your way up and, and eBay dropshipping also gives you a little bit of background about, you know, a search engine optimization on eBay and understanding a little bit how traffic works. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I 100% I agree with you. And I think that's a good point that you're making. And mm -hmm. at this point of the show, I actually want to take you uh, far, far back. How, mm -hmm. how, how old is the company? Uh, yeah, something like that. Okay, so I want to take you six years ago, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I want to ask you, Dobri, who have become an entrepreneur since then, mm -hmm. where are you six years ago, mm -hmm. and what are you doing in life, and what made you kind of look for a venture to start? Mm -hmm. How did you even get to the point where you're saying, I'm going to build a software for dropshippers? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. So... My journey starts with software. I studied software, then I went to Silicon Valley, working for a large uh, software company, like one of those giant organizations that has like tens of thousands of employees. I was working on ad systems back then, and I was a product manager. And basically throughout my life, I, I always wanted to, to start my own company and was trying to figure out how to do that, what to do, etc. I have a number of failed projects before that for usually the reason is that one of those three main pillars that I talked about, uh, building the software, knowing the market and, and being able to market, one of those was missing or maybe two of those were missing. So I tried a bunch of times with a bunch of different groups of people on a bunch of different projects and it just didn't work. Uh, and then eventually uh, this opportunity came up through that friend of mine who uh, knew the dropshipping sphere really well. By that time, I had quite a bit of experience on the software side. And so we decided to try it out and see, see how it goes. So basically... Wait, where was... Were you at the time in the United States, in Silicon Valley? No, Korea? actually, funnily enough, I was in Tel Aviv, exactly at that point. In Tel Aviv? Oh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, used to, I used to... So my journey is I'm Bulgarian. I was born here. Then I moved to the States to study. Uh, worked there for a bit, and then uh, I had to move somewhere else, so I went to Israel, continued working there, and then from there I moved to Bulgaria back to really concentrate on the company and, and try to scale it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful journey. <laughs> Thank you. So, so that's been the, the journey, and to be honest, I think one of the most important things is to, is to try to build a vision of, of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, entrepreneurship... You were Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, entrepreneurship definitely has its upsides, but it also has its downsides. You have to be able to, to tolerate in uncertainty, to be able to find your own way. Yes, sir. You're, mm -hmm. you're jumping. Okay. I want to stop you at the point before that. Oh, you yeah. said, I was in Tel Aviv, and then yeah. I were, I, a friend contacted me and said, mm -hmm. hey, I'm, thinking, I'm a dropshipper. I'm thinking about building a yeah. software. How did, what was the conversation? How do you know? Where do you know him from? Mm -hmm. Like. What made you say, you know what, let's do it? Mm -hmm. So, so here's how, to, well, first of all, where do I know I'm from? Way back when in high school, I wanted to be a DJ and he wanted to be a DJ too. And so we were making music together. So completely unrelated, nice. but you know, we've, we've kept in touch over the years and I knew he was doing something with e-commerce, but honestly, at the time I didn't know anything about it. Um, cause I was concentrating on the ad stuff and I just didn't know anything about it. And so he started. We sat down, uh, he visited me in Tel Aviv, actually he's a big fan of Israel, so he came over a few times and he was telling me about what he's doing, and he was showing me dropshipping. At first, to be perfectly frank, it sounded very weird to me, the fact that you can be selling stuff from a completely different country to people that you've never met, stuff that you've actually never even seen, to be perfectly frank, is amazing. At the time, it looked very strange to me, but once I saw that the model works and there's actually a bunch of people doing it, I was quite fascinated by it because I saw the opportunity for basically democratization of, of commerce. So if you think about before the internet, you had 
for every location, like for example, I guess you're somewhere in Israel, you could only open a store in your neighborhood and sell there. So that means your customers will probably be Israelis and maybe tourists, but whoever is around there. Now, all of a sudden, you can be Israeli or Bulgarian or whatever, and you can be selling in the United States or in UK or whatever, right? So all of a sudden, the, um, the fact that you're somewhere doesn't matter to who your customers are. And I think that's super powerful. And we're really seeing it with dropshippers, with our clients, that there can be people from anywhere and they can be selling in affluent markets where there's a lot of opportunity for, for profit and, and for good, for good business. So, so I, I saw that to be super, super interesting. And so we, we started looking at what other companies are doing. Uh, what software already exists, what seems to be problems that haven't been really solved. And that's how we started narrowing down to what we can try with. You didn't know ahead what's going to be the software. He didn't come to you and say, Hey, I want to build a software for my specific need. You started doing a research, looking into what exists or what doesn't exist. I mean, we worked on it together. So I, I, I wouldn't say I did the research myself. We, we worked, we did the research together. Basically he was telling me, Oh, I have this problem. And I have this problem. And I have this problem. And we tried to narrow it up for some problems. We found solutions already on the internet and for some problems we couldn't. So we tried to create a list of what those problems are. And then we picked the one that seemed to be most solvable and the one that we could try to build something for very quickly. Interesting. Did my company, DSM Tool, already exist at the time? Uh, I think so. I think you guys were just starting, if yeah, I'm not wrong. I right. think around 2016. That's Something like that. Yeah. 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 So actually, we looked at you guys as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you decided you're going to build a software. Uh, you find uh, that problem that you want to solve, mm -hmm. which at the time was updating tracking numbers for exactly. order. Yeah. Correct. And you, let's just explain for people who don't do dropshipping. Uh, what you guys decided to solve is that when you when you do dropshipping and you sell a product, let's say on eBay in our case, mm -hmm. uh, and then you need to source that product from, let's say, Amazon or AliExpress. Let's take Amazon mm -hmm. for this example, which was most popular uh, back then, maybe until today. Mm -hmm. um, then after you after you purchased the product and you shipped it to the person that bought it from you on eBay, uh, a day or two later, you need to update the, you need to take the tracking information from that product on Amazon and update it on eBay so that your buyer will know what's the status of the, uh, of the delivery. Um, more importantly, that eBay would know what's the status yeah, of the exactly. delivery. If they, yeah, of course, because they track you and you could get punished for uh, mm -hmm. not updating tracking numbers all time or not updating tracking numbers at all. Yeah. So you decided that you're starting uh, a software in that direction. Uh, mm -hmm. How long did it take to build the software? And what did you do in the meanwhile? Did, were you still working or did you completely went off of working and said, I'm going bonanza all in with no income and I'm, that's it, I'm betting on my life? Mm. I mean, there's that transition period was was less like abrupt than than what you what you were suggesting. It wasn't like okay, dropping everything now, let's go. I wanted to make sure that you know we actually have something that might be interesting. Um, but what we did was we built a, a, a very minimal product in about three four months. We launched it, uh, and by launching it, really, I mean we sent it to like ten or fifteen friends of Valentin who we know were drop shipping. And, and we gave it for free. So here's some software for free. Try it out. Let me know what you think. And basically that started the iteration cycle. So the moment you have some people using it immediately, they start telling you, oh, this is awful. This, I need this, I need that. This doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. And so you're immediately starting to get closer to what people actually need and want than what you thought they need and want. Right. In the software world, a lot of times, or in the SaaS world, software mm -hmm. SaaS world, a lot of time we refer to it as product market fit. You exactly. try to fit the product to the market that you're serving. Exactly. And I think, I really believe that this is a, a constant process. So you're always trying to improve, to listen to the people that you are using your software and try to understand what they need better and how to better serve that. But Dobre, you're talking about the software and I, I want to focus mm -hmm. on you. Okay. What happened in your life at that point? Mm -hmm. You moved to Tel Aviv. Were you working in the meanwhile while you were doing all of this transition process or did you drop your... Okay, let me say it mm -hmm. otherwise. 
a lo- I hear a lot of times people, especially in e-commerce, it's a little mm-hmm. bit less common in software, but also sometimes that they say, I'm going to start building a startup. Actually, my story was a little bit like that. I mm-hmm. dropped my job. I, I was a student when I finished, mm-hmm. uh, when I started DSM tool. So I just didn't look for a job. And for a couple mm-hmm. of months, I lived without an income mm-hmm. um, in order to be full time in the process of building DSM tool. Yeah. Um, but it's not entirely correct because like we've built it for a few months. And then when we launched it, we started seeing some results. And I said, wow, I need to focus on that full time because these are really good results. Mm-hmm. It's not enough income to for me to live on it, but I can live for a few months. If it's keep growing like that, mm-hmm. I only need like six months before I can finance my own living. Yeah. What was the story for you? Like, so did you work me, in the meanwhile? Yeah, that's a great question. For me, it's a bit of a different story because keep in mind, I was living in Israel as a foreigner, um, but I had already worked a few years in Silicon Valley. So I had saved up some money and I could afford to actually, you know, live without an income for a little bit. I didn't do the jump immediately. So it wasn't like, okay, here's the idea. Okay go away from my previous job and jump in. That's just not the kind of person I am. And I don't think that's good investing. Um, but once we had an MVP and once it looked like some people will be interested, I did the jump and that's actually when I moved to Bulgaria. Uh, so moving to Bulgaria, it, it's a, a lower cost of living place. You know, rent in Tel Aviv is crazy, but actually in Sofia is not so bad at all. So I, I knew that my, you know, my savings and whatnot could last me a lot longer here in Sofia, then, then they could. I take vacations to Bulgaria. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. As I feel like half of Israel comes to, to Bulgaria once a year. And it's yeah. amazing. And I love coming back to, to Israel, but that's a story for another day. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, so that, that was basically the jump. And it's really a really, really tricky point. Uh, it's it, it, There were quite a lot of sleepless nights making that decision because I was living a a reasonably comfortable corporate life. I I'm, I was pretty happy with my job at the time. I have nothing bad to say about my previous employer. Um, but in the end of the day, I knew that like my journey should be more exciting than that. And I should, I should try to believe in myself and, and try to make something bigger than that. And so far, sorry. Can you elaborate on what exactly was more exciting in doing that step? I yeah, mean, absolutely. I, to me, it's the scale. You do mention the downside, which means mm-hmm. I don't. I'm. I have less comfortable. I, I'm. I'm moving away from my comfortable corporate life. Mm-hmm. And you are a tech worker from the Silicon Valley. You mm-hmm. had no problem of of generating income from yeah. like working mm-hmm. in the best mm-hmm. companies in the world. Mm-hmm. So what what's missing? What's the what is this excitement that you're talking about that you were looking for? I think it's the, the lack of clarity. So when you work in a corporate environment, as long as you're doing okay and, and you're doing good, you will slowly rank, go up the ranks. Maybe in 10 years, you're going to be like a senior manager. Maybe in 15 years, you're going to be a VP. And maybe in, sorry, uh, turn off Skype. And maybe in, in 25 years, you'll, you'll be some sort of kind of like very senior guy. Um, but there's limited upside potential. So you, it's very clear what in two years you're going to be doing. And I th- find that uh, quite unfortunate. I think in entrepreneurship, it's much more exciting because you know what you're doing right now, but it's very possible that in one year, it's going to be two times, five times, 10 times bigger. It also can be two times, five times, 10 times smaller, right? But that's what makes it exciting. And that's what makes it very interesting. And I feel at least at, at the age that I, that I was at the time, and even that I am today, that kind of uh, higher uh, diversity of, of outcomes is, is exciting. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have a lot of uh, responsibilities and you're, you know, maybe a little bit later in life stages, maybe that's not for you. But at the time, it made a lot of sense for me. And I, and I still think that it does. And a lot of times people are saying that the difference between entrepreneurship and working for a corporate is that when you work for a big corporate and you finish your your day um never mind it what how what hours you're working but basically at least when you go to sleep let's put it this way uh, your work is staying a little bit more behind whereas Mm -hmm. where you're an entrepreneur it's 24 7 in your mind you're going to sleep with it you wake up with these thoughts that are running 250 miles per hour uh how do you feel about that thing 
I think it really depends on the person. To be honest, I felt the same way when I was in the corporate world as well. And I think that's why I wasn't such a great fit for that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to be thinking about it all the time anyway, and the rest of the people that you're working with, some of them prefer to have a better life balance and, you know, actually switch off from the job at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, that it causes some frustration, like it feels a bit slow, a bit difficult. Uh, and here you can, you know, take life in your own hands and really jump and see what happens. And I think it's also a matter of proving it to yourself, right? Because we all like to think that we're very smart and that we can achieve big things. But the only way to actually prove to yourself that you are that way is to try. Yeah, interesting. I, I like what you're saying because I'm, I'm having a lot of problem with like how people describe it. And I see people around me, especially in the startup industry that is very, very vibrant in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of close mm -hmm. to the Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and you coming from working in the Silicon Valley so you could understand it. I see people that are working in a very non-entrepreneurial jobs, but in startups uh, or in corporates that are growing very rapidly and the stress could be created there just as much as it could be created uh, when you're an, an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And it, it has a lot to do with, with your personality, with, with who you are. Maybe, um, Maybe there are jobs today in the in the 21st century that doesn't require that much of you, but I think that COVID-19 uh, gave us like that sent everyone to work from home, or those that were not able sent them uh, like made Sorry. made them jobless. Mm -hmm. Is is showing us that um, that work is going to be with us almost 24/7, mm -hmm. and maybe that is also an opportunity for people to realize that if job is anyway going to be there, like when I go to sleep and when I wake up and these thoughts are going to, to be, to, to be part of my life, this stress that we're living under, uh, then maybe I can channel some of it to building my own ventures and to finish the, I want to ask the last question and mm -hmm. hopefully the last question, let's see where we get from there which is I want you to tell people about your perspective on starting to, you said that you had some side projects. So mm -hmm. starting these side projects while you're doing other things in life and while you might be feeling, and as you said that you were working in the Silicon Valley and work, the stress that you had from work and everything, when you went to sleep with and you woke up with, how did you find the time and the mentality to do also side projects at mm -hmm. the same time? That, that's a good question. And in my mind, I think uh, two things. One is uh, being excited about the thing. And the other one is discipline. So um, let's start with the being excited about things. So I feel in, in the corporate world, usually there's some structure that's imposed upon you, right? There's like, you're part of this team that does this thing that, you know, makes money in this certain way. And that's great because that basically means you don't have to figure out what you're supposed to do, but that's also limiting. So at least in my mind that I still needed something that's more creative that I figure out. And that's what really excited me because there were no clear answers in that case. And so that's why I think that's why I needed it. And that's why I was excited about it. And as I said, we tried with other people, different things, and it really didn't work, but those were great learning opportunities. Um, and so, and, and they kept scratching that itch, right? I felt that, yeah, actually this is exciting to try, to try to build something. And yeah, if it doesn't work out, it's not great, but it's not the end of the world. You can survive and figure out something else. So that's the first thing is enthusiasm. And that's why uh, you can find that time. And then the other one is, is really having discipline. So yes, unfortunately, sometimes you have to like, you know, have a little bit less of a social life. I not play video games, uh, not really watch TV. Uh, I used to go to the beach in Tel Aviv. I, I love the beach, so I would still spend at least half an hour every day. But, you know, still keep it within a reasonable time, not stay there the whole night or whatever. So it does require, does require self-control. But I think as long as you find the thing that you're doing actually interesting, it, then the self-control part is not that difficult. 
uh, I think more more important it's in, it's important to show yourself that this is actually possible. I think for most people the real blocker is not really the lack of time, but the fact that they don't really believe that what they are thinking about doing is actually doable. Um, and though they have these mental blocks for one reason or another that tell them, hey, don't even start. And so maybe try to do something very small. Try to make something like it could be, I don't know, a, a, a small podcast or like a PDF or something that you sell for $10, $15. Try to sell it five times, see what happens. Just to prove to yourself that it's actually possible to do something. And really it can be in any sphere. I know a bunch of people who, for example, work in finance and they, to scratch that itch, they created like a little finance course for like $10. And that really showed them that it's possible to do. And then from there on, they went in the beginning. Teach Sorry? for free. Yeah, teach exactly. Free. Even teach for free. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just to show yourself that doing something is possible with, without having all that structure around you. And then from there on, you know, build bigger and bigger and bigger. I want to add to what you said about discipline that I think mm -hmm. one of the things that I learned um, le much later, unfortunately for me, much later uh, mm -hmm. into building the business uh, is work is to work with schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and working with schedule means like to have a calendar and to have time slots, at least for your meetings, uh, if not for when you do your tasks, but like right. to, to have that um, and to to try to stick to it yeah. and to uh, try to manage a task list. So yeah. using uh, any duo, Trello, Monday.com, whichever tasks management software that, that you can uh, work with. Um, and n when I say manage your tasks, I'm not only talking about having a task list and marking it with V, everything that is done, mm -hmm. but also uh, doing something that you probably know that is very popular in the software world, which is retrospective, mm -hmm. and which is finishing, let's say, a week or two weeks period of time, and then looking back at the tasks that you've done and asking yourself, were they really productive? Um, should I focus on that? Or maybe I could hire someone to, you know, on, on Upwork or Fiverr or one of those services that you can mm -hmm. find people relatively for cheap if you're only in the beginning. Um, and these are all kind of like this structure uh, is, is kind of part of the discipline that you have to, to take on yourself. And I totally feel you when it comes to watching shows. I have no idea what's going on in Netflix. Uh, social life is much harder when you're running a business. And this is a price that you have to be willing to pay. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just to add a little bit to that, to that structure, I absolutely agree. It, it's important to build your own structure. And the other thing I found useful is to uh, look, uh, try to keep commitment with, with your partner. So for example, with my partner back in the day, we used to have a call once a week and be like, okay, this week I'm going to do this and this and this. And last week I did X and Y and Z. And then when Monday comes the next week, you know that, you know, you're going to have to say, well, I promised to do this, but I didn't do it. And that feels pretty bad. So you have actually kind of an internal drive to fix it, to do the thing that you promised. And those are tricks that trick your brain into, into committing and into actually doing the things. Because in the end of the day, you're always fighting with your own brain. And maybe find a partner. You don't have to do yeah. everything yourself. Yeah. Because if you find someone to work with, you might be sharing the profits, but mm -hmm. who cares? You've mm -hmm. managed to build a structure, a commitment, a weekly, a, a weekly meeting, a task list. All of these things are so much more valuable when you're getting started than where you have the entire business for yourself or half of the business and you mm -hmm. share it with someone. I 100% agree. Absolutely. Well, we could do it for four more hours, I think, but we <laughs> did run out of time. So, Dobri, I, I just want to thank you for for coming here and for being part and for agreeing to talk. As as uh, you know, we're both entrepreneurs in the dropshipping software industry, um, and we both live outside of the United States, uh, although we work mostly with uh, with people from the U.S. but from all over the world, obviously. Um, yeah, uh, I want to to just say thank you for coming here, and I hope to see you again on the show uh, sometime in the future. Same here. Thanks a lot, Kerr, and awesome opportunity. I really support you doing these kinds of shows. I actually watched a bunch of the episodes, so looking forward to watching some more. Have a good Perfect. one. You're going to watch your own episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, have a nice one. You too. Bye-bye.